Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Um, so we've been talking about healing after trauma. And last time we left off basically at the third stage of grieving, which is anger. And I can tell you that this is a very real and present stage of the grieving process. And it also can take on many forms and many different ugly heads. And it also is natural and it's normal for you to go through that stage of grieving, which is anger. Um, so when I got married, first time, you know, all of the things that I was set up for were to basically handle a relationship like I was 12 years old, right? Because that's when the abuse started. And that's when the severe trauma in my life began. And when you are set up to have that arrested development at about age, you know, those tender tween, uh, early teen years, it really, for me, did not allow me to go through some of the natural things that, that I think I should have, of course. I missed out on things that a normal developing 12-year-old, 13-year-old would have. And so basically, my first marriage was very much a, a fantasy and very much a relationship that was built on something of like the perfect romance or the perfect, what would maybe be called like those feelings of infatuation. And not that I didn't know and love this person because I did and I still do. My first husband is the father of my son. He's the father of, you know, my child and his child. And he has been an incredibly important part of my journey of healing. Because if I had not had him and the experiences that he was able to go through, you know, with me in many regards, um, my healing process would not have progressed. But it did progress through that relationship and that marriage. And yet it was riddled with challenges, I think, because we, we both were raised in very religious homes where we were, you know, very careful about having our physical relationship go too far. And we were very much um, following all of those rules. And both of us um, actually served missions for our, our church. My ex-husband is, is no longer active in that church, but I have remained somewhat cautiously. Um, I'm a cautious believer in anything, and I'm a cautious um, participant in my own faith. Not that I don't believe in many of the things that I have been taught and that I have researched for myself, but I also have learned that I felt brainwashed in some ways with um, not so much by my parents or by, by anybody really in my early youth and even after and during, you know, all of the trauma and the kidnappings and coming home and going back to church and all of those things. But that brainwashing in and of itself, to me, is generally based on fear, something that you're afraid of afraid that you won't get, afraid that someone will be hurt, afraid that you'll be hurt, afraid that your family will be hurt. Fear, 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 fear for me is kind of the baseline of brainwashing. And because I was so severely brainwashed and manipulated, I am very cautious that if we are going to believe in something or we're going to teach our children to believe in something we also, which can be very comforting and very much, very important. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying it can be very important, but it also can be, it can set up a person to be easily manipulated, a young person. At least it, I think it did contribute to that for me. And because of fear, if we teach children to believe in something and it's filled with sort of a wonderful faith and a wonderful feeling of love for humankind and to serve and to be 
um, you know, better, more loving human beings. All of those things are positive. But the other side of believing in something can be the fear based where if you don't do this, you're going to, you know, be left out. You know, you're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven or you're going to not be um, looked upon as a worthy person or there's just a lot of fear that can also be used to manipulate and get someone to believe something. And so that's why I call myself a cautionary and a very curious person of faith. So I believe that people should make sure that if you teach faith to a child or to a young person or to believe in something, that you also teach them that it's okay to question that. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to look around and see what other people think and what other people believe in. And for me, having kind of the golden rule was sort of the basis of my belief system in my home, you know, that we were going to going to love one another and do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That was the basis of our belief in my home. And that was a very, that was a very good thing. And I still to this day believe that that is, you know, the golden rule is really the way to live your life. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So when you really think about that, what someone who manipulated me, who also pretended to be a believer in the same religion and the same values that I had, that became something incredibly um, confronting after the trauma of being brainwashed and manipulated was, um, was going on in the background. It became, I think, easier for me to almost accept and experience having be, to be a special person with a special mission. And so all of the relational things that happened as my own belief system was, was manipulated by taking something that I already believed in, you know, like the Christmas story, for example, that's something that, you know, we acted out in our family, you know, on Christmas Eve, you know, dad would get out the New Testament and we'd read out of Luke, the Christmas story, and we would sing certain Christmas carols, and we would put on the costumes, and sometimes I was the donkey, and sometimes I got to be the sheep, and sometimes I was Mary, and sometimes, you know, just I was the king, one of the three wise men, you know, and we acted out this story in our, in our little young living rooms and um, throughout my life in our, you know, or the family room in my home, and it was a very safe and tender and very, um, family, spiritual kind of experience. So for someone to come along and then to take that story and to change little pieces of it, just one degree, you know, how the airplane gets off, if it's just one degree off, that's what brainwashing does. So they take something familiar and then they, they insert something that is just a slight change that helps them get to their end goal, which for me, of course, was that I had a special mission. I was supposed to save a dying planet, that I was half alien, half human, kind of like, you know, Jesus was half from God the Father and half from Mary. <laughs> you know, it was like that idea. And so as those things happened to me inside of that abuse, my brainwashing, which was very, very real, it also stunted all of the other things that I should have been able to go through naturally as a young as a young tween and teenager. And so once I got married to somebody who also held those same beliefs and, you know, were in that idea that we're going to have the perfect, you know, we're going to have the perfect marriage and we're going to do all the right things and we're going to have, you know, children and they're going to grow up and they're going to be, you know, the Osmonds and they're going <laughs> to stand around and sing uh, songs and be in the plays. And, you know, that was my idea. The things that were stunted for me was having any sort of ability to look at a, a relationship from a more mature vantage point. 
So in that first marriage to my sweet husband, ex-husband now, and in all the ways that he tried to um, help me through basically those early beginnings of figuring out sexual feelings and all of that stuff that didn't work very well for me, um, I'm very grateful for, you know, the fact that he was super patient in those ways and also that we had a lot of other things in common, which ended up being a really important part of our our marriage, which is, I think it's important for any relationship to have things in common. But we both were performers. We were singers, dancers. We both got a job working at Disney World. And we that was our first job. And neither of us had even finished college. And so going to Florida and having the experience of being far away from our homes and far away from everything familiar to us was a good thing in some ways, and it was also a really difficult thing in other ways. So the challenge for me at, that, at this kind of stage in my healing process was trying to figure out um, what a more mature relationship, what it would look like, what it would feel like, what it would be like, and I had no skills to do that because I had missed out on those years. So we, you know, we had plenty of fighting that, that took place. And of course, there were other things, other issues that we were dealing with in, um, in, you know, in his own sexuality and my own understanding of my own sexual being and all of the things that come up. And there was a lot of anger that I experienced through that, that marriage. And, and, and it wasn't, always directed at my partner. And I certainly, um, once I had my son, I was just like wanting so badly to do it right and couldn't figure it out. And he had things that he was trying to figure out and couldn't figure out um, at that time. And um, with his permission, sometime I might go into more detail about, you know, that um, part of his own life. Um, but right now, I'll just talk about my own anger at just being angry that I missed, I missed out on these years of my life that I should have been dating and having crushes and having little romantic, you know, and I didn't have those things. I couldn't. I was forbidden. And so I retreated into just trying to do everything right. I became incredibly religious during that period of my life. You know, I, I had certain what we call callings in my church um, organization where I was like the leader of all of the young women, all the girls that were ages 12 to 18. And at one point when I was in that leadership position and I was dealing with all of these, you know, young women and, and I, we had teachers that would kind of teach us like a, a group. Um, but we would all come together and teach certain, you know, lessons and stuff together. And I remember there was a lesson on chastity and morality and being, you know, chaste and not, um, you know, and not having sex before, you know, you're married. That was a, you know, it's a big deal. And I remember reading through the lesson and it made a, a comment. And I think that this is no longer in the, in the lesson handbook that we had at the time. I mean, this is in, you know, the early, well, now it's about the late 80s um, because my son had been born. So he was born in 89. So this is the late 80s, early 90s. And it talked about how if you're not chaste and you end up, you know, if you have sex out of marriage, before marriage, that it's like the sin next to murdering somebody. And I remember reading that and I was so angry. I was so like, we are never teaching this to another set of girls, women. We shouldn't be teaching this to anybody. And so I brought all of my teachers together and my advisors and everybody that was part of the young women's program. And I said, look, we're all volunteers. We're not a paid clergy in this church. And I have a very strong opinion about what we're teaching to these young women because this makes me so angry that this is what is in this lesson manual and I won't do it. I won't have you do it either. And so if you have a problem with me going against this particular thing that it says here, you can let me know. We can go talk to our 
you know, ecclesiastical leader that's above us, but this won't be taught while I'm in charge of teaching young women, you know, good principles and about morality because we don't know if they've been through abuse, if they've had, you know, something happen to them. I remember when I came out of the brainwashing at 16 and made an appointment with my bishop, the ecclesiastical leader of my little congregation ward back in Pocatello, Idaho. And I started to tell him that I had done these things and that I felt so bad and that I knew it was wrong. But I, you know, and he practically, he was wonderful. His name was Tom Myers. And he came practically across the desk and just grabbed me and hugged me. And he said, no, nothing that happened was your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. And yet in my little mind, because that is how I had been taught and how I had been raised, I thought that I had done something wrong. And so I knew I would never teach that to another group of young women, young ladies, young developing tweens and teenagers. And it doesn't say that in the manual anymore. But, you know, at the time and thinking about my, that stage of my life and the anger that I was going through about certain things and pushing back against long-held patriarchal beliefs and belief systems, there was a lot of my um, anger and rage that, that came out in, in instances like that. And so um, I think that that was a really important growing period for me. And the healing that I had was to stand up for what I felt was being taught incorrectly or what I had gone through was not my fault and being angry that I missed out on those very important years of being able to develop naturally maybe some skills that would have helped me either in that first marriage or in the dating process um, because it, it wasn't over. You know, I didn't all of a sudden figure it all out and grow up and figure, you know, and, and do it right the next time. I'm still, you know, I still am struggling with trying to find um, the balance between a, a mature uh, kind of love and relationship and the relationships that I've had in my life that, and I don't think it's all my fault. I think that there's, you know, it takes two people to tangle, but a lot of my early anger um, about my kidnappings and my brainwashing happened in that first marriage and and came out in different ways. So getting into this stage of grief, which also, you know, it kind of, it comes and peppers back and forth. We'll talk about it further in other stages and how my healing began. But these were the first anger can have that good side to where you are ready to fight. You're ready to stand up and, and be and be heard and seen. And that's kind of what happened for me, which is definitely a part of my healing. So really looking at what your belief systems are and how you are handling either past beliefs that you've had or that you held from childhood and through your abuse years, and then to come into more of an adult um, time in your life and go, what do I believe? Do I really think that this thing is right or okay? And to start to have some of those angry feelings also can be the flip side of I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm going to figure this out and I deserve to heal and I deserve not to feel shame and guilt at every turn because I started into my marriage where I was always feeling guilty. I'm never doing enough. I have this big checklist. I got to check everything. Every box has to be checked so that I can feel like I'm a good person. And, you know, and it was just, it was just ridiculous. Really, truly looking back at how perfection was such a part of my thinking and um, such a part of my life. And I needed to get angry about some things so that it could get messy because healing is messy. And that's the thought I'm going to leave you with on this episode today is that healing and what you've been through and grief and the grieving process is messy. And it's messy for a reason, because you get to clean up the mess. And that puts you back in charge and in control of your, of your life instead of handing it over to maybe a rusty belief system or in, uh, over to other people who tell you what to do. You start to take something makes you angry about that. And that's a, that can be a very good thing, but it is definitely a part of the grieving process. 
and part of the healing process. So let's get messy. Thanks.